Hello booktuber, my name is Elizabeth. Welcome to my channel, Bouquets and Books. It's been a while since I did a recent reads video and I thought I better do one right now that it's mid-February because if I wait to the end of February to talk about all the books that I will have read in the month, the video will be three hours long. <laughs> so I'm going to talk about the books that I've read in February so far. Um, what I'm going to do, I'm going to mention all the books right now at the beginning of the video and I will leave timestamps in the description box so you can jump straight to the books that interest you the most. So uh, first, uh, the first two books that I read in February, I will not talk about in this video because I've already talked about them in a previous video. I read two, the two final books I had to read for reading Africa. Uh, they were books related to the two countries that faced one another in the final of the African Cup of Nations, and they were Egypt and Senegal. So for Egypt, I read a woman, no, The Memoirs of a Woman Doctor by Nawal El Salawi, and for Senegal, I read Murambi, The Book of Bones by Boubacar Boristiop. Now, I've already talked about these two books in that other video in my Reading Africa wrap-up, so I will leave a link to that. And in that video, there are timestamps in the description box, so you can go straight to this one if you want to. And this one I liked so much, I think I may do a distinct and independent book review video just about this book, because it's one of the best books I've read so far this year. So the other books I will talk about in this video in no particular order, um, P.G. Woodhouse, Carry On Jeeves, um, A Day in the Life of Ivan Denisovich by Solzhenitsyn, The Portrait of a Lady by Henry James, and I will talk about Georgette Heyer. Um, I'm going to start with, 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 with um, Solzhenitsyn. So uh, this is a classic of the 20th century literature, of 20th century literature. Uh, it was written by Solzhenitsyn in, I'm going to say, multiple versions. Uh, the first publication was in 1962 in the Soviet Union. But since this is about the Gulag, it is a, Ivan Denisovich is a prisoner in the Gulag, a, basically a political prisoner. So since this is a sensitive subject in the USSR, it was, of course, censored in some sort of way. And then by the 1970s, the regime in the USSR got even more hardline and the book was banned. Uh, the book was simply removed from all libraries and removed from everywhere. The, basically, the book was banned. And in 1973, Solzhenitsyn managed to smuggle a copy out of the USSR and a full uncensored version was published in France. And that is uh, a translation from that full uncensored version. Uh, I think I'm pretty sure that in English, too, it's that uh, translation. Um, it's a translation of that version, I should say. So this is a 1976 translation. Um, I'm going to say right away, I did not like the translation. I think the French translation got in the way. There were too many slang words that were old fashioned, that are not in use anymore, and that nobody understands anymore. So it was a bit of a hindrance to read the book. But since that doesn't concern most of you, I won't say anything more about that. The important thing in that book is the denunciation, I guess, of the conditions in the Gulag. It shows the absurdity of the system, it shows the cruelty of the system. Ivan Denisovich is a prisoner because during the war he was a soldier and he was caught by the Germans, but he somewhat managed to escape after two or three days, and that meant that he was a spy. So he was sent to the Gulag because he was a spy for the German, because he was captured by the German and then managed to escape. So it's the case of many characters in this book that they were prisoners, uh, held prisoners by the Nazis. Uh, one of them actually ended up in a concentration camp and survived. I don't remember which one it was, uh, if it was Sobibor. Um, he, he survived a huge concentration camp and then when the Soviet army liberated them, he was considered as a traitor to the Soviet Union because he, ha he had helped the Germans. So, um, yeah, so basically for all sort of absurd reasons, people were sent to the Gulag in Siberia in the 1950s. So that was under Stalin. Solzhenitsyn himself went to the Gulag in 1950-51. So it is based on his experience. And that is what makes the book very powerful is that we know all these things happened. Maybe not in that order, maybe not uh, specifically to Solzhenitsyn, but they happened. 
So this day starts as um, the, all the characters, but the main character, Ivan Nisovich, wakes up and he's not feeling well. He wants to go to the infirmary, but there are some rules there. The doctors allow only two patients and the two patients have already been chosen. So too bad for him. He has to go to work. And I, I won't talk about everything that he goes through in that day, but it's just a typical day in the life of a convict. Um, and I say convict with... Uh, yeah, with uh, it should be between quotation marks because I don't think they were convicted really of anything. They were just sent there uh, with show trials and no proof and uh, in mass. So um, yeah, for for most of the, the other prisoners in there, there are no well maybe one or two uh, actual criminals, people who actually killed people. Um, all the others are political prisoners of uh, various sorts. Um, yeah, th there are many characters in there that are very. Um, Atasha, lovable, I guess. Uh, very endearing characters. My favorite is, of course, Alyosha, because <laughs> it's a direct allusion to the brothers Karamazov. In the brothers Karamazov, the younger brother is named Alyosha, and he is very sweet and very religious. And in this book, there is one young character who was sent to the Gulag because he's a Baptist. And of course, that religion and any other religion, but particularly any religion that is not orthodoxy, um, was severely condemned in the Soviet Union. It was illegal. So he was sent to the camp and um, he knew basically that he would never get out of it. But anyway, uh, so that's one of uh, very endearing characters. And we see all sorts of very nice characters, some a little bit less nice characters, some clever ones, some less clever ones, and all sort of men that end up in the Gulag. And we see how they have to survive because of course the conditions are horrible. Um, it's in the middle of winter, the temperature is minus 20, um, it's in Celsius, but even in Fahrenheit it's pretty much the same thing. It's extremely cold, uh, if you don't have enough clothing you can easily die of hypothermia, and of course the convicts are not well clothed. Um, they are sent to build some stuff, but they are not given the tools or the materials to do it, and they have to figure out how to do it. Um, and they have to figure out how to have enough food to survive and they have to figure out how not to be sent to, um, oh, how can I say that, a uh, particular place, I guess, um, isolation or something, where the food rations are diminished so much that when you get out of there 10 days later, your chances of surviving are close to null. Um, and yeah, it denounces all this horrible and absurd situation. So it, it's a very compelling read. In short, so it reads quickly. It's about 200 pages and it's totally, totally worth it. Next, uh, a much, much bigger book. The Portrait of a Lady by Henry James. I started this one in January, but I finished it in February. <laughs> um, and it's... That one is over 600 pages and uh, it's printed teeny tiny and uh, yeah, it, it took me a little while to read. Um, the main characteristic, I would say, of this book is that it is slow paced, very, very slow paced. Um, it's a character focused book. Uh, if you like uh, plot based books, maybe this one is not for you. If you like character based books, this is awesome. And it's also very, very well writ written. Um, it's the sort of book that you enjoy just reading the sentences, regardless of what they mean, <laughs> because the sentences are pretty. Uh, so it was very enjoyable to read this. Um, so what it's about. Um, it's a young lady who arrives in England, uh, brought there by her aunt, who married... In a, well, she arrives in England. She, she's American, I should say that. Henry James was an American who lived in Europe, so he writes mainly about Americans in Europe. And uh, so that Our Lady, uh, Portrait of a Lady, the, the, the lady in question, is a young woman who is recently orphaned, um, and she used to live in Albany, New York, in the 1850s, um, 60s. This starts in 1870, early 1870s. And um, so this young lady is brought to England by her aunt, who is married to a rich American, uh, working at a bank or owning a bank, perhaps, uh, in London. And uh, the opening scene is on an estate, uh, on the lawn of an estate in England. It is owned by Mr. Touchett, the uncle of uh, our lady. And um, there is his son, Ralph Touchett, a friend of his son and a neighbor, Lord Warburton. 
I'm not quite sure how to pronounce that. Is it Warburton, Warburton, Warburton? I don't know. So I'm going to say Warburton. So uh, so there's this Lord Warburton. And I should say that uh, this young lady left behind a young man who was very much in love with her. So this young lady has nothing particular going for her. She's not rich. She's not exceptionally beautiful, though she is pretty. And apparently there's some sort of beauty in her. But the narrator never makes it clear what it is that makes her beautiful. Um, she's not particularly talented, she's not uh, particularly intelligent, she's not stupid, she, she's far from being stupid, but she, there's nothing exceptional in her, except perhaps that she is independent-minded, I guess. She wants to see the world for herself. She wants to learn, she wants to know about the world. So that is her main characteristic and that is her main quality. Um, but despite having so few qualities, men fall in love with her. She gets proposals right and left and everybody wants to marry her and she wants to remain independent. So that is basically the gist of the book is to see whether she will manage to maintain her independence if she will make the right choices. Um, what else? There was something else I wanted to say. I forgot, I forgot. I wanted to mention the narrative voice in this book. Um, at first, at the very, very beginning, uh, because it opens uh, on the lawn of an estate at tea time with young people uh, of marriageable age, I had some sort of Jane Austen vibe. However, it became clearly, clearly that it's not the case. It became very clear that it's not the case because of the narrative voice. The narrative voice, I did not find it very generous to its characters particularly not the main character. Um, as I said, the, the main character appears to have no quality, even though all the others are falling in love with her, she appears to have nothing special. So I think that that impression I get that our main character has nothing special is because of the narrative voice that is not very generous towards her. And the narrative voice is not very generous towards any character, I think. One exception perhaps would be Mr. Touchit. Um, and as we go along in the book, further in the book, it, the narrative voice becomes kinder to other characters. But at the beginning, it's, it's not kind to any characters. Um, and by the end of the book, it's not kind to a number of characters, but it's kinder to some, a few of them. So if I don't want to reveal anything, if I don't want to spoil the book, because so, li so very little happens that it doesn't take much to spoil the book, um, there's not much more I can say about it. I, I can only say that if you like slow-paced, character-driven books um, and well-written books, this is a very good read. And I will definitely read some more Henry James. I liked it enough for that. Okay, uh, next, uh, the, the next uh, two things um, are a bit uh, because of the situation. So the next book is P.G. Woodhouse, uh, Carry On Jeeves. This is a book I bought a couple of years ago uh, because it's out of print. P.G. Woodhouse is out of print. I don't understand why, but if you want to buy some P.G. Woodhouse, you have to go to used bookstores. It is not, uh, I don't know if it's a blanket um out of print things, but I know that recently I looked for some P.G. Woodhouse search and specific books, uh, Jeeves and Wooster books and uh, Blandings books, and they were just out of print. I could not buy them new. So uh, anyway, <laughs> so I bought this a couple of years ago and I went for it this weekend or the previous one. The reason is, uh, because of the context, I need some cheering up. Uh, I mentioned it in a previous video, and uh, depending on when you watch this video, it might not be relevant at all. But I live in Ottawa, and as of filming this video, the downtown of Ottawa is occupied by a convoy of truckers protesting various pandemic measures. Um, the situation is getting more or less desperate. Uh, as I am filming, uh, the Emergencies Act has been uh, invoked, has been um, uh, adopt not adopted, but uh, has been, I don't have the verb for that. But basically, the Prime Minister is saying we're going to use exceptional powers, the sort of powers that we use in times of war, in times of insurrection, to put an end to these protestations. It's frightening in a way, but at the same time, um, it's necessary. It's kind of sad, but the truckers there, I unfortunately, I have to say, met a few and they are not kind. They are not good people. They are bullies and they are, 
they are bullies. I'm just going to say that. They insult people. They harass people. Uh, they have no regard for the rules. They have no regard for other people than themselves. Um, they are draped in Canadian flags, deluding themselves that they are speaking for the Canadian people. When they are not, they are speaking for a teeny, extremely tiny major minority. They are speaking for basically no one but themselves. And yeah, they they think they have the law on their side, or they, I should say they don't give a shit whether they have the law on their side or not. And of course the law is not on their side, but anyway, um, I need some cheering up. <laughs> so I read some P.G. Woodhouse. So this is a classic uh, Jeeves and Wooster book. Uh, Wooster, Bertie Wooster, is a young gentleman who has uh, too much money for his own good. He doesn't need to work, so he just goes to clubs and visits rich friends and rich aunts and uncles. And uh, he ends up uh, being in all, so, in all sorts of weird and funny situation because uh, he's kind of dumb. <laughs> However, his valet, Jeeves, is extremely brilliant and managed to get him out of all sorts of funny situations. So this is a collection of short stories. I prefer uh, the Jeeves and Worcester books when they are novels. Um, for some reason, I think the comedic element doesn't come out as much in the short stories. It's uh, a, the, the situation are not satisfactorily resolved. It, it relies too much on coincidence. So I prefer novels. I think the novels are perhaps better built uh, than um, the short stories. Uh, in this one, the last short story is narrated by Jeeves, which is original. Normally, every Jeeves and Worcester book is narrated by Bertie Worcester. So uh, it, it was nice to have a different point of view, to have the point of view of the valet instead of the gentleman. So that was fun. And another thing that I read to cheer myself up was a romance. I tried for the first time a romance by Georges Heyer. I borrowed from the library Arabella. I loved it. I loved it. It was so good. <laughs> so, um, Arabella is a Regency romance, and all Regency romance come from Jane Austen, and more precisely from Pride and Prejudice. And in Arabella, the uh, gentleman, the hero of the book, is a Mr. Bull Maurice. And Mr. Bull Maurice is a proud, disagreeable sort of man. <laughs> now, if you've read Jane Austen, that is some sort of dog whistle. You know exactly what to expect. Now, it, the book is not a retelling of Jane Austen at all. Um, it's a romance that stands on its own. It's not a retelling of Pride and Prejudice, I should say. Um, however, there is this uh, Mr. Beau Maurice who is uh, proud and disagreeable. Uh, but as opposed to Pride and Prejudice, we see right away that uh, it's just an impression that he's a nice man and that he has a sense of humor. As opposed to Mr. Darcy, he does have a sense of humor. And... Uh, Yes, he, he, it's just a story between that Mr. Beau Maurice and this Arabella, our main character, who is the daughter of a vicar uh, in the countryside in Yorkshire. And she is invited to the season in London by her rich godmother. So that, that is the premise and you can guess where it goes. And it was just a pure delight. So what happens is that um, there are not that many Georgette Hire available at the library and a bunch of them are available at the main branch and the main branch of the library is closed because of the truckers. So what I did is that I went to a used bookstore and I found a bunch of them and I bought a bunch of them. So uh, book haul. <laughs> I bought four romances by Georgette Hire. Uh, I, read, uh, I bought The Quiet Gentleman and A Civil Contract, These Old Shades and Bath Tangle. So these are all Regency romances, except one I think it's a bit earlier. It's uh, mid 18th century, I think. Uh, and I've already read this one, The Quiet Gentleman. So this is a romance, uh, a Regency romance, uh, but it's a bit different from um, typical romance. Uh, first things first, the main character is a man. So we see the book mainly, the, the story mainly from the point of view of the, the male character and not the female character. And a second thing is that the romance is not necessarily at the forefront of the book. Um, the main plot line is more a rivalry between uh, the new Earl of a name that I can't pronounce and doesn't matter anyway, and his half-brother, 
who is the youngest one, so is not the heir, but was spoiled and um, was liked more by his father than the earl, uh, the new earl. So the rivalry between these two brothers is more at the forefront than um, the story, the, the, the love story. Um, that is a bit uh, underlying, but it, it's a slow burn. So if you like slow burn novels, uh, romance stories, this one is very good. And I gobbled it in about two days. So <laughs> it also works wonders to cheer me up. And uh, yeah, so now I have three more George at Hire that I will read. I don't know if I'll read them all in a row because uh, maybe that's too much sugar and I'm going to get sick of it. But it's good to know that they will be on my little shelf there. And it will be good to know that I have a few romances to fall back on if, uh, if I feel the need to. So that is what I've read so far in February. So let me know in the comments, have you read any of these books? Do you want to read any of these books? Or what have you read so far in February that you love? Thank you everyone for watching. I will see you in the next video. À la prochaine!